fact what all STEM librarians need to know. This is the first of what I hope to be many uh, webinars from the Hot Topics Discussion Group. Um, and we're saying STEM librarians on campuses across the country are at the forefront of much of the debate around research metrics and impact assessment. But practical information on how these metrics are being implemented into library services can be surprisingly hard to come by. We hope to remedy that for you. Uh, we have three speakers today, and I'm going to do all the bios now. Then we will have three, uh, three presentations and then questions at the end. And I'm going to ask you um, if you have a question during the course of the uh, uh, speaker's presentations, if you'd want to start a private chat with me and just shoot me the question, I'll add it to my list of questions. And then you can, uh, um, we'll do those all at the end. <clears throat> all right. So Daniela Solomon received a BS in electrical engineering from EAC Technical University in Romania and an MS in library science and information from the University of Arizona. She joined Kelvin Smith Library in 2012 as a research services liaison to biomedical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science, material science and engineering, and mechanical and aerospace engineering departments. Her passion is to connect campus community with the best engineering resources available at Kelvin Smith Library. Danielle is an active member of American Society of Engineering Education, Engineering Libraries Division. She is interested in scholarship metrics, open access, and instruction. Our second speaker, Rachel Borchard, is a associate librarian at American University and works as a library liaison to the science departments. She holds an MLIS in medical librarianship from University of Pittsburgh as well as dual BA degrees in psychology and neuroscience from Oberlin College. Her professional research focuses on the intersection of metrics and libraries, and she has co-authored several articles on the topic and a recent book publication titled Meaningful Metrics, a 21st Century Librarian's Guide to Bibliometrics, Altmetrics, and Research Impact, published by the American Library Association and available from the ALA Store and Amazon. Our third speaker, Stacy Conkeel is the Outreach and Engagement Manager at Altmetric, a data science company that uncovers the attention that research receives online. She studies incentive systems in academia and infra, uh, infometrics and has written and presented widely about Altmetrics, open science, and library services. Pre previously, Stacy worked with teams at Impact Story, Indiana University, and PLOS. All right, our first speaker is Daniela. Daniela is still setting up her microphone from the looks of it. She's having some audio difficulties. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you. You're up. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry for the trouble. I've been running up the stairs to fix it. Uh, so hi, everybody. Thank you for participating. Um, so my presentation is going to be academic impact metrics, perceptions, myths, and facts. But since the main topic of this webinar is research impact, I think it is important to start by clarifying what is understood by impact nowadays? Until recent years, the common understanding of impact was academic impact. However, a more comprehensive definition that reflects the current research environment is a definition developed by the Research Council in UK, demonstrable contribution that excellent research makes to society and the economy. So, what is impact? There are two sets of keywords within the definition that I would like to bring to your attention. The first set is society and economy. The emphasis on research influence on society and economy beyond the academic merit 
is a result of the need to provide evidence of benefits from funds invested in research. And there are, a various, there are various ways to account for such influence, from policy making, technical innovations, and generating wealth to solving environmental issues. The second set is contribution and excellence, and I would like to bring in discussion what constitutes as contribution and excellence and how this can be demonstrated. Contribution can be demonstrated through both quantitative and qualitative means. For the academic impact, the quantitative assessment could include numbers such as publication numbers, citations, usage grants, rate of acceptance, etc. For the society impact, it could be the number of people impacted by changes in policies or procedures. Or for the impact on economy, it could be the numbers demonstrating contribution to economic growth through technological innovations. Demonstrating contribution by quality Qualitative means is a little more challenging to do, but it is equally important with the quantitative part. The encountered issues are caused mainly by the difficulties in collecting this kind of information, and I think Stacy and Rachel will have more to say about this part later in this webinar. So what is excellent research? Defining what excellent research is proves to be more challenging than defining contribution. The criteria defining excellent research are worthy topic. But how does one define a worthy topic? Next is reach rigor. But how to assess reach rigor when there are, has been observed an increase in number of rejected articles? And sincerity? How to assess sincerity when there are plagiarism and published fake results. It is therefore important that all these elements are taken in consideration. It is also necessary to use a wide variety of indicators to account for impact in order to ensure a comprehensive assessment of the quality of research and its broader impact. Since it has become important to demonstrate impact to funding agencies, Assessing the research impact is in the interest of researchers and institutions, and the obvious place to start is tracking the impact of research outputs, or the academic impact. Current practices for assessing academic impact are limited to quantitative metrics. The, mon the most common metrics in use are number of publications, citation counts, journal impact factor, and age index. These metrics have created strong controversies related to what is really being measured, the maturity of metrics and tools, and limitation of academic freedom and creativity, as well as the effect of publishing culture. When considering these metrics, it is important to consider what exactly is being measured and the strength of the evidence it provides. For example, Number of publications. Although we live in a publish or perish academic environment, the current scholarly communication system makes the publishing process difficult without necessarily ensuring the desired level of quality. As such, number of publication is a productivity measure and does not demonstrate quality of research. Additionally, this metric did not keep up with the recent changes in scholarly communication and has been slow to include new forms of scholarships, for example, data sets or multimedia. Citation counts. Citation counts are used to measure the influence of a paper on a sub subsequent literature, and it is based on the assumption that citations represent the positive recognition of such influence. However, as it has been proven many times, there are various reasons for citing, like disagreement or coercion. Besides the influence issue, citation counts available are incomplete, as they depend on the venue of indexing, as well as there is a large number of errors. Citations take a long time to accumulate, and since there are large variations in citation behavior among different disciplines, Citations counts are not useful for comparison across fields. 
Other characteristics of citation count metric are sensitivity to popular trends in science and under us underestimation of the contribution of applied scientists. Journal impact factor is a metric derived from citation counts that tentatively measure the impact for journals. Published annually by Thomson Reuters as a journal citation report, the impact factor is the average number of citations received by the papers published by a journal in the preceding two years. When calculating impact factor, all citations are given equal weight, and there is no differentiation based on the citing journal, prestige, co-authorship, or type of publication. Despite its prevalence, the uh, impact factor has a number of serious problems, such as a short time period is considered when cal for calculating uh, when calculating uh, impact factor unclear methodology or the fact that impact factor is web of science data bound and citations from elsewhere are not counted. More critically is its improper use as a metric for individual researchers when it is clear that it does not reflect the value of individual papers. And finally, H index, well, that is another citation based metric. Uh, H-Index attempts to measure both the productivity and quality of the published work of a scholar and is readily available in some sources or can be easily calculated. What is important to understand about H-Index is that it represents a single measure and cannot be used in isolation. Among the recognized H-Index challenges is the fact that it cannot be used to compare researchers at different stages in their careers nor can be used to compare scientists from different disciplines. It is also difficult to determine it for scientists and interdi interdisciplinary subjects. Regardless of whether they are good impact factors or not, age index and impact factor have become the golden standard in assessing the academic impact. The results of a survey published in Nature News in 2010 show that these metrics are used at many institutions for tenure and promotion, and that there is a strong disagreement toward their use as tools for evaluation. One of the reasons is that metrics are an uncomfortable topic for scholars. Well-intentioned, not always well-informed, often ill-applied. It is also believed that metrics distort scientific priorities and undermine research integrity by encouraging quantity and not quality publishing topics of popular interest or cause incarnation to fabricate results. And also, the belief is not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. In conclusion, metrics constitutes a proxy measure for academic impact. Each metric measures only one aspect of the impact and all are venue dependent. Metrics are more difficult to gather for interdisciplinary subjects, not useful in comparing scholars and prone to gaming. And as we all know, uh, the metrics are to skewed towards STEM disciplines. So what do librarians need to know? It is important to have knowledge of what each metric measures, their issues and challenges, as well as the tools to be used. Even more importantly is to have knowledge on how to maximize the impact as measured by these metrics, because this is what faculty and administrators are most interested in. Awareness of the variety of metrics available. In order to correct some of the issues of certain the traditional metrics, many other metrics have, has, have been defined, such as variations of age index correcting for the age of the author or co-authorship, or additional journal metrics that extend the time period used for calculations, offer the means to compare across disparate fields of research, or offer free alternatives to impact factor. These metrics can be used standalone or in combination with other metrics. New developments, books and data citation indexes, alt metrics, all these are 
uh, new ways in which we can uh, demonstrate impact, get new data. And also, metrics represent a new opportunity for library services as librarians are well positioned to contribute to impact assessment efforts due to knowledge of and experience with the tools providing the metrics. In conclusion, as no single metric can encompass all of the multidimensional complexity of impact, it is important to use a wide variety of indicators that go beyond the bibliometric analysis and academic output. Libraries could be at the forefront of assessment efforts by developing expertise and offering new services as needed. We just have to be open to learning new skills and explore new horizons. And with this, thank you for your attention. So I think I can take over from here for the second part. I hope. So I'm uh, going to kind of take, a, take over where Daniela left off um, in shifting from more traditional bibliometrics into starting to talk about altmetrics uh, with particular emphasis on how libraries and STEM and STEM libraries are starting to talk about and implement um, these metrics. So a quick overview uh, is going to be first, um, Stacy's going to talk more in depth about altmetrics themselves. Uh, but then we'll look at some ways that libraries are supporting metrics and some recent developments that are happening within the altmetrics community. So first, a brief introduction. I think probably a lot of uh, today's participants have heard or are relatively familiar with altmetrics. But for those of you who it's new, um, the more or less official definition for right now is the creation and study of new metrics based on the social web for analyzing and informing scholarship. My personal definition that I prefer is anything that's really non-citation-based metrics, which I think kind of uh, creates a broader category and is more easily understood as separate from bibliometrics. But you can see here, uh, altmetrics are drawn from a wide variety of sources. Um, so this is really just a small sample of different places where we can gather online metrics that really tell us something about how scholarship and scholarly works are being shared and disseminated and discussed as they move through an online environment. And so as they come from a, a bunch of different sources, gathering all of these metrics is also in some ways rather tricky because they live in so many places. And this is something that I always stress to my faculty um, because it's not always completely intuitive. Um, journal article usage is probably one of the trickier ones in that um, some publishers currently provide usage metrics. Um, for example, uh, Web of Science actually just started uh, within the past month to uh, put usage counts within the Web of Science database. Um, so you can see the, the first image here with the time cited in the last 180 days. Um, those are actually live usage counts that are coming from Web of Science that are measuring every time someone downloads a publication within that database. Um, alternately, publishers like uh, PLOS and Taylor and & Francis and Elsevier are also making their own usage data available um, separately of databases like Web of Science. Um, when a paper is shared on a scholar lead network, uh, like Mendeley or ResearchGate, we can also track the views and downloads that result within that uh, environment. So down at the bottom, the five publications and 111 views, that is um, statistics that are coming from ResearchGate. Um, additionally, the individual, uh oh, I don't know if anyone else can see my slide. OK, sorry. <laughs> Something happened. Um, uh, we can also get metrics directly from many individual sites. Um, so in the bottom right corner is a demonstration of the number of views um, of my SlideShare presentations over time. And finally, we do have tools that um, harvest a whole bunch of metrics and make them together in one tool, um, one example being Altmetric. And in the upper right corner is an example of displaying different types 
of metrics that are available for one journal article. Um, and Stacy from Altmetric will be talking a bit more about that. So now that we've gathered Altmetrics, um, what are some of the ways in which researchers and scholars are starting to use these Altmetrics? Um, these definitions are actually hot off the presses. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about where these are coming from um, a bit later in the talk. But um, to kind of gather and put them into three broad categories of use for Altmetrics as we're seeing them now, um, the first thing probably most obvious is kind of as a natural complement to bibliometrics uh, as a way to assess research. Um, with that in mind, I think one of the key messages when it comes to all metrics is that what we're looking at is not necessarily impact itself. And impact is a difficult word to define and really, as Danielle alluded to, um, really track down in terms of quantitative and qualitative evaluations. And I think what we're seeing happen when we discuss altmetrics is more of the online or in, uh, attention or engagement that uh, publications and other scholarly works are receiving. That said, there is some um, discussion within the altmetrics community and some publications that are trying to look at, are there certain altmetrics that better predict later citation counts? And I'll, I'll talk about that about that a bit more later as well. Um, the second major category would be to showcase your achievements. So not just assessing, but saying, look at this article, look how well it did. Um, and those are used in situations like tenure and promotion when applying for grants or at the end of a grant when you're trying to demonstrate the impact um, that your research had based on the grant. Um, this is a good time to mention that there is uh, increasing calls for being able to demonstrate your impact, um, including uh, the so-called broader impact demonstration. That's one that NIH specifically has asked for, which tends to align really well with altmetrics, because we find that altmetrics sometimes are doing a much better job of measuring that broader impact than existing metrics do. Uh, finally, the third category of altmetrics that people think about less is the discovery element but of actually using altmetrics to find research, find collaborators, and to decide where to publish. Um, do I want to publish with the journal that is making those metrics uh, and usage statistics available to me? Um, do I want one that's more actively involved in the altmetrics community? That sort of discussion. Um, but again, with the Web of Science usage counts as an example, we can actually sort within Web of Science by the usage in the past six months to see what articles are people actively downloading and looking at now or within the last six months, even if their citation counts may be low? So it's kind of a new way to discover research that we haven't had before. So moving on to some uh, types of library support. So I'll talk about five basic uh, types of ways that we're seeing libraries supporting uh, metrics and alt metrics, starting with the good old research guide. Um, there are many examples out there. If you just do a search for uh, site.edu and altmetrics or research impact or metrics, you'll find many, many good examples. Um, but a good one has some basic information, um, maybe walks you through step by step um, how to sign up or start using some of these tools. Um, UNC Health Sciences is the one that's displayed here, and I think it's a good example for that reason. Um, what I see as a good future direction for these guides is to start customizing for your specific disciplinary audience. So this is for the health sciences, um, but we could make one specific for, say, biological sciences or for biology that uh, customizes the tools that make most sense for that discipline. Uh, next we have workshops. And I, I personally, of the uh, types of ways that we can support, this is the one that I've kind of found the most traction with, I think, um, research guides a very passive level of support in that it relies someone to physically go to that guide, whereas a workshop is kind of a, an active participation uh, of whoever is there during that workshop. Um, so some tips that I have, and along the right-hand side, we can kind of see how my own presentations have evolved in the past three years. So these are some of my takeaways um, based on workshops that I've done here at American University. Um, that targeting the information to the relevant audience will have a much greater impact. Um, and that includes using the terminology that's really going to speak to them. So you'll notice in fall 2012, I called it bibliometrics an impact factor. And this past fall, I've kind of changed it to 
focusing on your research impact. Um, and I think that's really spoken to faculty. Um, another big tip that I have is that uh, a workshop just focusing on metrics may not be as interesting as one that covers some wider issues and really co uh, contextualizes uh, metrics. So in my um, the presentation that I did in t fall 2015, um, I was invited to speak during the orientation for new tenure track faculty. So I knew that um, it, you know where they are in their research process and what information is going to be most important to them at that point. Um, so we talked about maximizing research impact um, in three stages, which are listed along the left-hand side, um, strategically choosing a good publication venue, using things like impact factor, but also those uh, other considerations that we talked about, the discovery layer of alt metrics. Maximizing your exposure, and this can include things like scholarly networks, open access, and some of those other scholarly communication issues. And then finally, measuring impact and engagements. And that's when we start to talk more about both traditional metrics and alt metrics that are available, mentioning tools like Impact Story that they can use to gather all those metrics together. So if you want to see uh, the slides that I, I gave during that presentation, the tiny URL is up on the screen. Um, but my recommendation for the future is to continue packaging um, and even offering a menu of topics for possible presentations to specific uh, groups of people. Um, one of the nice things about metrics is that it does pair really well with some of these other larger issues in academia, including open access, institution repositories, scholarly communication, et cetera, et cetera. So the more that you can make it more appealing to those individual faculty members, I think the better success these types of workshops will have. Um, just a side note, as you're starting to think about delivering presentations, there is a wonderful online toolkit that actually has some pre-packaged um, content for delivering presentations. And if you see in the screenshot of their homepage, they actually have already tailored materials for geography and computer science. And I'm hoping that more disciplines will be added in the future because that's another great way to take a more general topic and really narrow it to a science-specific focus. Next, consultations. This is probably something that many of us are already doing, but um, it's kind of the most basic support we can provide is really sitting one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member with some, some sort of metric need or interest and talking them through their research and what tools would be best for them. Um, so I put up this handout because I think it's a really does a good job of outlining all of the services that their library provides and what exactly we can help with and what we can provide for them. Um, but again, in the customizing theme, I could easily see having handouts that are customized for each discipline uh, or sub-discipline, um, something like that, so that they're really aware of the tools that are available that are specific to their department or discipline. And symposia are another fairly popular, gaining popularity uh, way of supporting these kind of broader conversations through the library. Um, a lot of them bring outside speakers to talk about um, topics that are related to metrics, and often that comes under the broader theme of scholarly communications. So I know at AU we've had a, a series for a little over a year. Um, Georgetown also has one. This is just in the DC area. Catholic University also has a scholarly communication symposia. Um, but I do know that some libraries, instead of bringing outside speakers, will actually pull together faculty from their university to give uh, talks, which I think in some ways has a different impact in that I think faculty respond to other faculty very well. So it's something I'm interested in looking at the future is trying to get faculty to talk about some of these scholarly communication and metrics issues. Um, but one of the nice th uh, things about it is that we can then use these symp symposia as a way to highlight uh, what the library is able to do and how they, we can support these issues. And finally, there are institutional level altmetrics products. I'm not going to talk about them in great detail, but just to note, Plumex and Altmetric both offer these products that are really designed to do that uh, research assessment and showcase achievement goals of altmetrics at a very high level. And there's a URL if you want to see some more about University of Pittsburgh's implementation and some of the uh, barriers and pitfalls that they encountered along the way. So finally, 
because I know I'm running out of time, uh, what's happening right now with altmetrics. So we'll talk a bit about the work that NISO is doing, some current research that's happening, and the ways that some, uh, two specific STEM disciplines are implementing metrics. So first, uh, the NISO working groups. There are currently three working groups that are meeting right now. And I can attest to it because I'm part of the definitions and case uses group. So when I made uh, reference to the three broad uh, classifications of alt metrics and their uses, that actually is a working document that is coming from that definitions and case uses group. So it may change before uh, these are finalized, but hot off the presses as of a, a week ago or so. Um, but in addition to that working group, we also have two other working groups that are working on the data behind alt metrics, as well as the methodology of how we calculate those alt metrics. So what I see is kind of the end result. It's not going to solve all of our questions or answer all of our questions that we have with alt metrics, but I think will help to improve the reliability um, and help to standardize some of the fuzziness, if not all of it. Um, but ultimately, what I hope that it will do is help increase others' confidence in alt metrics, and that includes people like uh, evaluators and uh, people like grant funders, people who might be using these like researchers. So look out for uh, NISO. We should be publishing our results uh, within, I would say, the next six months or so. Um, but there will be opportunities for feedback. So keep your eye on this research as it happens. Um, some other current research that's happening. Information scientists have a lot to say about altmetrics, and they're continuously publishing on this topic. Um, and keeping up to date with that research is a really great way to start to figure out, how can I translate this altmetrics to my specific community? So as you can see um, along the right-hand side are three examples of articles uh, of taking out metrics and applying it to specific um, disciplines or areas of academia um, to try and figure out what does this look like um, so that we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. Some of the other research that's being done is to try, as I said, to correlate different types of metrics. Um, and you can see in the lower left corner, this is one of the first studies that was done by Jason Priam and Heather Puwar called Altmetrics in the Wild um, that was just looking at different types of metrics and what correlates with each other. Um, this particular study found that there's about a 0.6% correlation between uh, PDF downloads and later citations. Um, so those kinds of studies are being done, and it's a good way to start to package different types of metrics that are available for different purposes. So for my faculty, I like to tell them, uh, for very recent articles, pulling those usage metrics can be at least a decent predictor of future citations, um, as long as they're explaining it in a file for, say, tenure, that it's definitely uh, a type of metric that we can use now that we couldn't use before. And finally, a couple of examples of ways that uh, specific disciplines are dealing with metrics. This one is actually a little old, but uh, a lot of people aren't aware of this. But the American Mathematical Society, in large part due to the issues that Daniela was talking about with impact factor, um, produced a, uh, a report, essentially a statement, in 2009. Um, and the, uh, the link to the PDF is available if you'd like to look at it. But it's a essentially a condemnation of impact factor for their field, saying, please do not use it as a way to evaluate our research. And I think that this is a really, really good example of ways in which specific disciplines can take charge of their own metrics um, to start to say, this is how we want to be measured, and this is how we feel we are most accurately evaluated. And finally, uh, Stacy's going to talk a bit more about the Becker model, but I just wanted to mention it as another example of how we're starting to see dis discipline-specific metrics evolving. Um, so the link is available for you, but they've essentially taken a ton of different uh, types of activities within biomedicine and uh, listed different indicators of how we can measure each of those types of uh, activities. For example, on this page, conferences, data, databases, funding, and gray literature materials. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to save questions for later and turn things over. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, Eloise, would you mind putting up the slides for my 
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so while those are loading, uh, my name is Stacey Conkiel. I'm the Outreach and Engagement Manager at Altmetric. Uh, we are one of several companies that gather up some of the types of metrics that Daniela and Rachel covered in their sections. Uh, so I'm going to talk very briefly about what types of metrics you might be able to find depending upon different disciplines that you're serving. Many of you are liaison librarians across a great variety of STEM disciplines, so we're going to talk about specific examples that might be relevant to you and your faculty of these traces that are left online, these um, altmetrics that can be really, really relevant to showcasing impacts beyond traditional impacts for your faculty. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Rachel touched upon one of my favorite definitions of uh, impact, and that is the Becker model. And this short list right here just pulls out a few key points that the Becker model makes in terms of the types, the different types of uh, impact you might have particularly in the biomedical sciences. You might, as a researcher, make a contribution to the knowledge base. We measured that with citations, right? We were pretty good at knowing um, and tracking how that sort of um, impact happens. Um, there are other newer types of impact that before we weren't necessarily able to track uh, very easily anyway, things like implementation of policy or legislation, changes to clinical and research practice, and so on. And all of these different types of impact, um, they have associated metrics that serve as indicators for that impact. So what do I mean when I say indicators? Very jargony, right? Let's break that down. So citations are indicators for your contribution to the knowledge base. They're indicators for change in understanding. And they're only indicators. They don't directly correlate to a change in understanding because we've found that researchers cite each other's work for many different reasons. Researchers, they may cite you, or they may cite your researchers, um, to say, Dr. Bronner, he's made a great change in our understanding of breast cancer. They might also cite him to say, Dr. Bronner introduced this method in this paper that he wrote in 1976 that we used for our own data analysis or collecting of, of, of stem cells or what have you. Um, they might cite Dr. Bronner to say, Dr. Bronner was wrong, we, he, and we're going to prove how and why. So citations can merely serve as indicators. And when you look at the raw counts of citations, let's say if Dr. Bronner's paper has 15 citations, whereas you know some of his other earlier work only has one or two citations, that is an indicator for you or an indicator for Dr. Bronner that something's happening there, that's something you want to go look and dig in and see OK, this might be making an impact. Let's find out how. Um, and similarly, we have these other metrics that exist online now that research is networked, research is web native. More researchers are conducting their uh, scholarly activities online. They're discussing other people's scholarship online. So we have a lot of traces that we can gather, like we can text mine mentions that scholarship receives in policy documents or legal code. We can look and see the discussions that are happening on social media or in mainstream media. We can text mine patents to find out if research is having enough economic benefits. So we've got a lot of different indicators um, that, as an umbrella, they fall into this group that we tend to call altmetrics. They're distinct from citations, right, because we're looking, like Rachel defined, at the social web, these things that we weren't able to measure before using tools like Web of Science or Scopus in order to understand other impacts among other audiences, not just a scholarly audience, but among members of the public, policymakers, and so on. So we've got this treasure trove of data, right, that now exists, thanks to the ubiquity of the internet, where can you find this data? How do you pull it all together? There are a number of platforms all across the web, Wikipedia, Figshare, Dryad, Twitter, uh, we've got mainstream media sites. You could go to each of those to find altmetrics for scholarship, uh, but you can also use an aggregator, a service like we provide at Altmetric or like Impact Story provides, which pull together a lot of these metrics for you into a single report. So you can just go to one place to find them. 
And so I'll just tell you very briefly about two of the services that we offer. Um, I used to work for Impact Story, so I, I hope they don't mind if I speak for them uh, in showcasing some of the different metrics you can get. Uh, but I'll start out with Altmetric. Uh, so we are a commercial entity. We provide a lot of different services. Some of you may already be familiar with our Explorer, uh, which we track over 4 million articles. Um, and we're, we look at basically all sharing and discussion of scholarship that happens across the web. But that's really an enterprise solution. Uh, and what's relevant today is our bookmarklet. Uh, so this is a browser bookmarklet that you can install if you go to altmetric.com slash bookmarklet. And anytime you're on an article out on the web, you can click the Altmetric it button, the, the bookmarklet, and you'll get this summary report, which we see here in the upper right, that gives you a brief overview of all the metrics for that particular article. And if you click through, you see a report like this, uh, which not only provides the metrics, but also provides things like data visualizations and, crucially, the full text, or, or snippets anyway, and links to the full text of these mentions that are happening in the mainstream media, what research bloggers are saying about a, a piece of research. Um, it links out to citations uh, in policy documents in Wikipedia and so on. And beyond, so we provide a number of services. Um, and we connect to a number of services, I should say, uh, one of which is Faculty of a Thousand Prime, which some of you might be familiar with. For those who aren't, this is a service where um, experts in biomedical sciences and life sciences, they're invited to review a paper that's already been published and review it for its relevancy to the field and also rate it in terms of quality. So we see here this particular paper. It's gotten three stars. It's been recognized by experts as being exceptional work, and in particular, that it changed is clinical practice. So this would be a really good example for researchers in the biomedical sciences to include in a tenure and promotion package or a, um, uh, a grant application or even an end of year review if they wanted to say, hey, I'm making high quality and impactful work in the biomedical sciences. For those who are working in um, economics, public health, any field that might have relevancy to public policy, we also collect mentions for public policy. We scrape a number of sources, um, including UNESCO, the World Bank, and uh, U uh, UK government, in order to find where research has been cited in public policy documents. And then there's the question of quality and impact in uh, medicine and translational science. Um, one of my favorite examples of that is Wikipedia citations. Uh, many are skeptical, which I get. I understand uh, Wikipedia is uh, relatively new, right? Um, it's only been around for 10 or 20 years now. Um, but it is one of the highest and most widely read um, uh, websites on the internet, period. And as it turns out, a great majority of edits to biomedical Wikipedia are made by researchers, and doctors and practitioners find Wikipedia to be their number one source of healthcare information. And if they notice that there are errors in Wikipedia articles, they will edit them as well. So we've got experts in medicine and translational sciences actively contributing to and maintaining uh, the quality of Wikipedia articles. So um, showcasing your, uh, your research um, uh, and, or your researchers, your, your, your faculty's research, uh, finding where they've been cited in Wikipedia can really be a good indicator for impact in medicine and translational science. So we've got a number of data sources for our bookmarklet. And um, I mentioned before that we've got uh, the Altmetric Explorer, too, which if you'd like the free librarian edition, you can email me after this presentation to get access to that. We're happy to provide that. Like I said, it provides that 40,000-foot view of all articles that have been published that we, we track. Uh, but now let's talk about impact story. So at Altmetric, we're really good at tracking articles. We started out as a service for publishers. So we're excellent at tracking research articles. We've recently moved into books. We also do a bit of tracking for scholarly products that have um, DOIs and other persistent identifiers. Um, but there are a number of products that exist out there on the web that don't have these persistent identifiers. It might just live on a researcher's website or a site like GitHub or Dryad. Uh, and those are the types of products that Impact Story is really good at tracking impacts for. So Impact Story, if you sign up for a free account, uh, well, it's a free trial anyway. They've since moved to a subscription 
uh, model in the past year or so. Uh, what you do is you connect your third-party services like ORCID or um, your SlideShare account. And what this does is it automatically imports a all of your research products that these other services know about or that they might store. Uh, and it also goes out across the web and finds associated metrics for those. So it, it imports a bunch of stuff automatically. It's super easy to set up. Um, we see here there are a number of different types of research outputs that impact story uh, profiles, track. And let's talk about, in, specific, uh, in particular, software products. So if you wanted to showcase the influence of your work, if you're developing code in bioinformatics, cheminformatics, any other informatics, uh, perhaps digital humanities, although that's less relevant for this group, right? Um, also, if you're working in the computer sciences uh, and developing code, uh, as a researcher, you might put your research on GitHub, which for those who aren't familiar with it, is a collaborative coding website. Um, and when you're on GitHub, other people can star your software. So Phylosift, which we see here is an example of Holly Bick's software that she's uploaded uh, to GitHub. And other people have starred it, which is akin to, uh, if you're familiar with Twitter, if you use Twitter, you might favorite a tweet on Twitter, that's kind of a hat tip to say, hey, I'm reading this, or I want to remember this for later. It's also, for those of us who are more analog, it's like underlining a really compelling passage in a book. It's your way of saying, this is good, or this is interesting, I want to return to it later. So we've got 44 people, uh, which is 90, it's uh, more than 99% of all other software products that Impact Story currently tracks. Um, but who is actually starring this work? I think that's, in many ways, ways, more relevant. So we've got researchers and coders from across the world who are really interested in Phylosift. Uh, and that can maybe, in and of itself, applying for grant funding, um, that might show a broader impact, particularly if you've got a very, very well-known bioinformaticist or uh, software developer who has shown interest in your work. Uh, so that's just one way that Impact Story showcases the impacts of non-article outputs. They also do articles, but they're really, really good at showcasing non-article outputs like software, like data, and so on. So I just want to emphasize, uh, I'm coming to a finish here, but metrics really only tell a very small part of the story. Um, anytime you see numbers, it's really just an indicator for potential impacts that might exist if you look at the qualitative data. So who is saying what about research and in what context? Um, I just want to give some very quick examples of how these metrics are being used from both Impact Story and Altmetric. We're seeing faculty um, from across the sciences and also the humanities use Altmetrics when going up for tenure. So they might supplement their CV that they submit with their tenure dossier. They might put Altmetrics in their dossier. Uh, librarians, I want to give some specific examples of how librarians are supporting Altmetrics. Um, so, Rachel talked about these classes uh, that are happening. Um, Rebecca resnick Zellen at UMass Medical School Library is giving a lot of these classes as of late. She's also doing a lot of reports upon request for committees and department chairs and faculty. And these reports are being used in many ways. Um, but what I think is really, really important about the work that Rebecca is doing is that they're very, very careful to define the metrics and their sources and their limitations. So she'll include all sorts of citation metrics and also some alt metrics in these reports. And she'll be very careful to say, for example, Google Scholar, this is a big number, but it includes non-peer-reviewed work in the citation count. So take this with a grain of salt, and so on. Uh, grant application support at Galter Health Sciences Library at Northwestern. Uh, Karen Gutzman uh, and her team, they're doing really, really good work. They've got a great online guide that gives specific examples for researchers to use metrics in their NIH bio sketch. She's also doing one-on-one -on -one researcher consultations. And just yesterday, we did a, a webinar um, that where she and her colleague, Pamela uh, Shaw, they broke down exactly the sorts of services that they're providing. So uh, I'll share these slides after this webinar. And you can go and, and check out the recording there. 
Uh, and then creating live guides. Rachel also touched upon this. Hundreds of these guides now exist. If you want to roll your own, I, um, when I was at Impact Story, created two alt metrics that are CC, or two live guides that are CC by license, so you're free to use them with attribution, uh, and a guide for researchers and a guide for librarians. So that's it for me. Uh, I think we can now turn it over to uh, questions. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Daniela, Rachel, and Stacy. Um, also, thank you to all attendees at the moment. It's great to see so many people show up. We actually seem to have broken ALA Connect, and people were turned away at the door. So uh, I'm really gratified to see there's so much interest in the topic and the idea of these webinars. Um, real quickly, I posted in the chat window an assessment form, so if people would please fill that out before before leaving. Um, and then on to the questions. Uh, again, if you have other questions, if you would open a, a private chat with me and just shoot me the question. Um, otherwise, I guess I'll read them out of the regular chat if they come up. But our current question is can the speakers comment on any experience with normalized citation metrics which take field and age and type of article into account? Yeah, so this is Stacy. I'd be happy to answer that. Um, I think normalized citation metrics are the only citation metrics that uh, should really be used, especially um, in terms of evaluation purposes. And so I think it's our duty as librarians um, to learn these normalized, field normalized citation metrics, many of which exist. Um, I'd encourage, we can send around some links after the webinar with specific examples. Um, but when you're talking to faculty, when they're coming to you for advice, when you're compiling metrics on their behalf, which I know many of you do, um, explain. This is what a field normalized citation metric is, and it's much more relevant than citation count, and it's going to help those who aren't in your field, uh, who might be reviewing your tenure dossier or your grant application, to understand the actual impact of the work that you do. Because as a physicist, you might get you know hundreds of citations for a paper that might be pretty normal, and if you're in mathematics, you know you're going to get maybe 10 or 20 tops. The citation differences are very, very vast from field to field. So I encourage you to encourage your faculty to use these sorts of metrics. OK, another quick uh, procedural question. Um, there were, <clears throat> we are intending on posting the recording of this. So if you want to come back and review anything, you can. And we also hope to find a way to put the slides up um, if people want to be able to look at them apart from the, uh, the presentation. We'll see if we can do that. We can't guarantee it, but we hope so. Um, the next question is, do you have any recommendations for measuring the impacts and use of data sets? Yeah, so this is Stacy again. Um, impact story, they provide some very basic metrics for data sets that are hosted on Figshare and Dryad, which is a small portion of the data sets that exist out in the world. Um, but it's still very useful for many researchers. So they take things like um, downloads and citation counts in addition to social media metrics that we can uh, gather. Um, so that's a good place to start. I'd also encourage you to check out the Data Level Metrics Initiative that I think it's Datasite and Martin Fenner are putting together. Um, that, along with the work that was done by PLOS and California Digital Library, they recently wrapped up a big survey uh, where they went out and they interviewed data managers, researchers, a bunch of people as to what are the most relevant metrics that they're using in terms of understanding the impacts of their data. That was part of a grant called Making Data Count, and it's a really good starting point for understanding, OK, what's the lay of the land? Um, citations are big, but Data citation is not something that is a widely practiced yet, so that would be the, the, the best case scenario. But um, short of that, many people are using things like downloads and page views to understand uh, the relevance of and the interest in their data as well. But then you've got other types of um, metrics that you might be able to capture, like if you were to share numeric data on GitHub, for example, you could look at things like stars or forks. That's how many times people have cloned your data set so they can work with it on their own and maybe add to it or do analysis on it uh, locally. There are a number 
uh, of many metrics. So I'd encourage you to check out the Making Data Count uh, and the Data Level Metrics Initiative data site. And just to add to that, um, in case you aren't aware, Web of Science also has a data citation index that has been around for maybe two years or so. So there are definitely a lot of different groups that are trying to tackle this problem of appropriate citations for data sets. Um, so I, I think we're getting there. Uh, but you know, maybe a while before this is all standardized, thanks to the help of people like Martin Fenner. All right, another question. <clears throat> I have gotten many questions, particularly by math faculty, whether it should count. So I, uh, this is Rachel, I guess I'll go first. Um, my personal take is I don't see any reason why they wouldn't count, uh, um, especially if we are talking about citations. Usually people tend to get a little weirder when it comes to things like article views or PDF downloads. Um, but if it's a citation that's resulting in, say, the white paper or their own preprint or a, a journal article, it's a pretty strong uh, statement of impact, even if it is a preprint. I think the only thing that we would want to do is make sure that if uh, there is a final publication that those citations get merged together. But the information is the information, whether it's gone through uh, a final editing process or not. So I'm OK with it, but I know a lot of citation ultimately comes down to culture within disciplines, culture within departments, culture within universities. Um, so if nothing else, you can always direct it back at them and say, maybe this is a discussion to take up at a departmental meeting. This is Stacy. I'd say that um, a big, maybe the, the preprint versus postprint distinction um, is the most important thing, right? So uh, encouraging your faculty to make it clear that, let's say, when they're compiling their CV for, um, whether for personal use or end of year annual review, to have separate sections for work that has undergone peer review and has subsequent citations versus work that hasn't yet been peer reviewed versus work that maybe is peer reviewed, it's in print, um, but it's also you know, up on a place like archive or another preprint server, and therefore accumulating citations uh, as just a matter of course. So I think that's where the function lies for many people is kind of that peer review versus not peer reviewed version. And uh, so I, I'd, I'd maybe couch it in those terms as well. I'm Chaniela, if I can intervene. Hello. Uh, if the preprints are uh, deposited in uh, institutional repositories, this can offer uh, other kind of information about uh, the preprints, like uh, usage, downloads, and views. So maybe you can separate citations and views, because we, we know that these uh, numbers come from different sources. and as Matt says uh, in his uh, comments, collapsing this in one number might affect the uh, H index. So I, I would suggest to have them listed, but not collapsed, not put them together. Um, all right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I. I think we actually need to end now at 2 o'clock. Um, I think we've used up our time. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Uh, thank you, speakers. Uh, thank you, Eloy Sharp, for all your hard work behind the scenes keeping this running. Um, we hope uh, Hot Topics is going to do more of these presentations. Please fill out the, uh, the form, the assessment form, so we can get some ideas of of kind of how interested you are again. I'll, I'll re-chat that question and we'll include the, uh, the URL in the, um, in the follow-up email when we tell you when we've gotten the, uh, the thing posted. So um, the recording and everything. So thank you very much.